Matthew 24. Let's read the word. Oh, watch this. <laughs> you can see my screen. When Jesus left the temple as he was going away, and he, he was going away, when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, Y'all see all these? Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. King Herod, Herod the Great, started building the temple in 20 BC. That's 20 years before Jesus was born. Though it's a little misleading because Jesus was actually born in 5 or 6 BC. If you want, I can go through that another day. But at any rate, he started building it in 20 BC. Now, I know there's a lot of Herods in the Bible. Let me just give you a brief synopsis. Herod the Great is the granddad. He was the Jewish puppet king of Rome. But he was the Jewish king of, of all of, let's call it all of Israel, Judea. Um, and when you see in the Bible, like Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch, like one-fourth, that means he was ruler of a fourth. Like maybe he had a fourth here and a fourth here and a fourth here. Because again, Herod the Great's kingdom got broken up in four parts. His brother Philip and you know his son and grandson. Oh, I forgot the light was on a timer. Watch this. Don't fear, guys. That's a lot of time. I did this on purpose. You can't make this up. Like, you can't make that up. Are you kidding me? Like, you know what? That's commitment. What other pastor would do that? Others would have just quit shut it off and erased it, save themselves the embarrassment. I, however, have already embarrassed myself a million times before, so I don't really care. Uh, Jake says, could you please change your text to a white background for those with older eyes? Sure, Jake. Absolutely, I could do that. Sure, you want me to do that now? You know what? Let's see if I can. Jake, you know what, man? I don't mind doing that, but if I try now, I know I'm going to fail. Like I, I just know I am. Yeah, I'm I'm even nervous to try, dude. I'm so afraid. So afraid, Jake. You're killing me here. I don't know what any of this means. I'm probably right there. Uh Jake, yes I can next time. There's there's my answer. Yes I can next time. Alright. So look, I'm probably gonna have to get up and do the lights thing again, and that's okay. I'm not worried about it. So look, um, Jesus left the temple, he's going away. Herod the Great was building this in 20 BC. And, um, you know, in John chapter 2, the Jews make a comment Herod's been building this for 46 years. It's taken him 46 years to build this because it was an ongoing project. Because even though it was built, there were some beautification things, gardens and things like that, uh, courtyards. So, that is an excellent timestamp. Now, y'all listen to me on this, especially those of you who just read through the Bible and don't pay attention to what you're reading. That means John chapter 2 happened in approximately 26 AD. Approximately. There's no zero, so you got to count that into it. 25, 26, 27, because if Herod started building in 20, and then it's been 46 years, approximately 25 uh, to 26 AD, is when John chapter 2 happened, which fits with the timeline of Jesus dying in 29 AD, which is wh where I think it falls. At any rate, at any rate, I'm just waiting for the light to go off again. Uh, at any rate, he then, verse 3, he's sitting down on the Mount of Olives. Oh, and, and another thing. Note when it says truly. Look over here, I'll turn on the thing for you. When it when it says truly, Greek word, amen. Amen. Guys, when you say amen, English or truly or verily, uh, all you're saying is that's true. I agree that that is true. When you say amen, that's not the end of a prayer. That just means I agree. That is true. That's what you're saying when you say amen. Um, no problem, Michelle. <laughs> I did my best, Michelle. I really honestly did. Someone even told me last week that the background's wrong. I'll fix it. It, it helps me see it better, believe it or not. But I can fix that. All right, so look. Um, that has his death being 29 or 30 AD, which fits the timeline. 
So they've really asked Jesus three questions. In verse 3, they say, tell us when these things will be, what will be the sign of your coming, and the sign of the end of the age. So they're asking three things. When will these things be? What's the sign of your coming? What's the end of the age? Jesus answered, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. You see that you are not alarmed, for this must place, uh, take place, but the end is not yet. So what we're about to read in verses 4 through 14 are the beginnings of birth pains. Not the end, the beginnings. Wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. and You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will, the end will come. So that section 4 through 14 are the beginnings of the birth game. So when a woman's pregnant, she knows the ends in sight, but we're still at the beginnings of the birth pains. Let me read that list of um, signs of the beginnings of birth pains. False Christ, wars and rumors of wars. Jesus says, don't be alarmed. Be wary, but don't be alarmed. Nation will rise against nation, famines, earthquakes, worldwide persecution of Christians, apostasy, betrayal, hate, false prophets. Please note, atheism is not the ultimate enemy. False religion, false prophets. Lawlessness increases, the love of many grows cold, the gospel is proclaimed throughout the whole world. Then, after those birth pains, Jesus says what will happen next is that we will enter into the great tribulation. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. I love that little line. Let the reader understand. It gives me, um, I guess, confidence that even Matthew puts in this note, let the reader understand. Um, confidence of uh, that those who are in this time, when they read this, will understand what's happening. Now, you can go back and read about the abomination of desolation in Daniel. Referring to uh, a blasphemous sacrilege in the holy place. When this happens, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here, and I'm I'm gonna read you what I wrote. Um, of course, we're not referring to. Well, let me keep going. Let me keep going. Shut up, Josiah. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. Let the one who's in the field not turn back and take his cloak. But alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter on the Sabbath, for then there will be a uh, sorry there will be great tribulation, such as not has been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. We're coming back to verse twenty one. And if those days have not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, "Look, here's the Christ," or "There he is," don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders, as so as to lead astray, if possibly, in the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out there. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe him. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there will be vultures. Uh, vultures will gather. So, um, I, I want to read what I wrote. And I'll, uh, let's see, watch this, boom, right there. This great tribulation is not to be confused with tribulation in general. Jesus promised that tribulation would come to those who choose to follow Christ, John 16, But the great tribulation refers to, I believe, a three and a half year period before Christ's return. So all Christians should expect and be prepared for tribulation, even unto death, but the great tribulation refers to a specific period of time. Now, we've gone over this before, uh, and I'm sorry for those of you who haven't been with us when we've gone over it before, but to respect those who have, I'm not going to re-go over everything. 
Remember, a preterist, or a preterist if you have to, but a preterist is someone who sees many of the prophetic passages in the New Testament, Matthew 24, much of Revelation, parts of Thessalonians, etc., um, as, uh, as things that occurred within the first century, specifically the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Okay? So a preterist is someone who believes most of that uh, New Testament <laughs> prophetic passages were fulfilled in, in 70 AD and in the first century. Not all, but most. For example, they want to say the return of Christ obviously has happened yet. A futurist is someone who understands those same passages to be referring to something still in our future. Now, obviously, as believers, those are two pretty big differences. Now, while we should see those as big differences and see that they do matter, if we stand united on the core of the gospel, if we stand united on the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture, if we stand united in these things, we can still be united and be okay with our differences in eschatology. It doesn't mean they don't matter. It just means they're not of primary, of utmost importance. So long as your eschatology includes the judgment of the living and the dead and the return of Jesus. So, yeah, um, I think, my opinion, uh, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Again, this is part of it. I'm doing this on purpose. So, isn't it cool that kind of happened after I read the verse that said the sun will be darkened? Isn't that kind of cool that that happened? <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, sorry guys, we're just not in that kind of church. Uh, Fancy and all. I'll figure out a way to fix that. But until then, this is just what we're going to have to deal with. At any rate, um, <laughs> at any rate, did you know verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation, these will happen. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. I find verse 29 to be a strong argument for futurists. It says, immediately after the tribulation. Well, you know, immediately after the tribulation, if we are to understand the first half of Matthew 24 to be a first century event or series of events, um, then happening immediately after that would obviously not fit in. Though um, they would probably translate this word as suddenly. Which, uh, you know, I even got it on the top right, is an appropriate translation. Uh, sometimes suddenly as opposed to immediately is an appropriate translation. Uh, that's a debate for another time. I think verse 21 is the strongest argument for futurists. And, and look, again, I, I don't make this a you're in the kingdom or out of kingdom for being a futurist or a preterist. Or, or, uh, I'm not that at all. But let's just read 21 again. For there will be great tribulation, such as has been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Let's get this off me and all the scriptures. For there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be. No. If I'm to understand Matthew 24, 3 through 20, to be first century events, and I don't mean to belittle what happened in the first century with General Titus and Nero and the persecution and all that. Mm, but that was kind of just around Rome and Jerusalem and the Mediterranean. 
far, in my view, worse events have happened in history since then. Bionic plague. And if you say, no, this is a judgment for the Jewish people, well, how about the Holocaust? When it says there will be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be, I read that as I read that as something that has not happened yet. But take it or leave it. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. All right. Um, verse 30 is a summary of Christ's return detailed in Revelation 19. When they will appear in heaven, the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. It says they will look on him who they have pierced. I do not think verse 31 is actually a reference to the rapture. But instead an assembling of all the elect in heaven and on earth in preparation for the reign during the millennial reign. So I believe the rapture has already happened at this point. Uh, he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds. Because if... I understand the rapture right. It's not in use with angels. We'll be caught up together with him in the clouds. At any rate, at any rate, um, I admit when we're dealing with end times things, it is not an easy harmonization. That doesn't mean God's word is not clear or anything like that. But it's not an easy harmonization. You know, if you've been reading in Thessalonians a lot lately, or you've been reading in Psalms a lot lately, or you've been reading in Revelation a lot lately, if you're unbalanced in, in what section you've been reading, you might lean one way or another. At any rate, um, I'm going to show you what I think is a great argument for preterism. Now, again, I'm a futurist, but I'm going to show you what I think is a great argument for preterism. Let's keep reading. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Um, for a long time, for a long time, I didn't understand this, and it troubled me. I think it's a good argument for preterism, but then I finally understood. I'll read one. In 2434, in chapter 2434, Jesus is not speaking about the generation in front of him, his disciples, but the generation of people in the scene he just set. In other words, this generation of people in the Great Tribulation who live through the abomination of desolation of false Christ, that generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So when the things at the beginning of chapter 4 start happening, the beginnings of birth pains, Know that within a generation, Jesus will be returning. That is my humble understanding of the text. So, I don't want to give too much away because this is a question for Wednesday night Bible study in two weeks that I'm writing up a response to. I think when we read that as this generation is in, the generation Jesus is living in will not pass. Well, of course, that's a great preterist argument. But if you read it as the people he's talking about in the story he's telling a future event, this generation that I'm talking about will not pass away until all these things come to pass. That's how I read it. It makes perfect sense to me. We have people living in the beginning of birth pains and people uh, and, and people being scattered and wars and rumors and wars and people falling away and false prophets and not being deceived. And the gospel of the kingdom being proclaimed to the whole world and the abomination of desolation, people fleeing to the housetop and women who are pregnant and, and so on and so forth. That generation will not pass away until all these things have come to pass. All that will happen within one generation. Which, if there actually is a beginnings of birth pains period, a rapture, a three and a half years of peace and a three and a half years of great tribulation, of course that fits within one generation. Again, uh, we're not doing all eschatology today. We're sticking with Matthew, but I'm just giving you a few tidbits. Um, 
So that's, that's my humble understanding. Let's skip down the verse. Uh, oh, but concerning that day, verse 36. Concerning that, that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor of a son, but the Father only. Of course, we know that Jesus was veiled in some of his understanding in his human form. For as it was in the day of Noah, so will be in the coming of the Son of Man. I'm waiting for that light to go off again. For in those days, as before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in the marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. When they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, one will be left. Now, I might be wrong, but I don't actually see verse 40 through 42. Because it says, verse 42, stay awake for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I do believe in a tri pre-tribulation rapture. But I think the comparison of Noah's flood and the warning of the teaching in 42 through 51 make it clear that this warning is not to wait till it's too late. Because those who are taken seem to be swept away in judgment, not taken up in glory. Let me make sure I'm being clear. Why I do believe in a rapture, and I actually do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I don't think verse 40 through 42 is talking about that. Two men in the field, one's taken away. Two women grinding at the mill, one's taken, one's left. I think that's a judgment passage. Because the comparison, as as it was in the days of Noah, and they were swept away by the flood. Well, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. I think it's talking about Jesus' return. It will be a violent return. If you have a problem with that, I'm sorry. That's how Jesus presents it. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must always be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master set up in the household to give him the food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if the wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him to pieces, and put him in the hypocrite, with the hypocrites, in that place there will be weeping and weeping. So look, that's my last time doing that because we're almost done. We've gone over this before, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so look, just, just to go over this again, I, I know this is just but a brief synopsis of Matthew 24. Barely deserves to be called a synopsis, but just to briefly go over it again. We have... Uh, the disciples asking Jesus about the great temple. And he says, hey, man, one day, not even one stone will be left on top of another. He talks about before his return, earth pains, the beginnings of birth pains. But the end is not yet. Then he talks about great tribulation. Then he talks about his return. Um, the preterist has a very large gap, obviously. Between verse, well, let me make sure I'm being fair, 28 and 29. A very large gap. But that doesn't immediately make them wrong. Because in Old Testament prophetic passages, we have within the same verse, partial fulfillment in one millennia and future fulfillment in another. For example, and you'll have... In some of the Psalms, some of the fulfillment will be in David's lifetime, and some of the fulfillment will be in the lifetime of the Messiah, and some of the fulfillment will be in the Messianic kingdom. Same with Joel chapter 2. Same with Joel chapter 2. You'll have fulfillment at Pentecost, and then you'll have more fulfillment at the end times. So we'll have prophecy about David's son, ruling the kingdom, and within the same breath saying his kingdom will be established forever, <laughs> which is a reference to the Messiah. So we can't say the predators is wrong simply because there's a big time yet there. But again, I, 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 um, 
I'm on the future side of things. But at any rate, there's Matthew 24. I think it is really intriguing and something that we need to be aware of. Verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place. The end is not yet. Do not be alarmed, for this must take place. Guys, sometimes we get crazy about eschatology and end times discussions. Jesus says, in the beginnings of birth pains, when there's wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. We serve a sovereign God. Things will happen in his time, not ours. In the podcast, Brandon and Anna were talking about that the other day. We don't want things in his time. We want it in our time. That's how God operates. He's not interested in our time. We have a sovereign God and a sovereign king who does things in his time. Exactly at his time. No one knows the day or the hour. Now, we do know the season. You know when the fig tree's getting ready. Right? You know uh, when its branches become tender and it puts out its leaves, you know summer is near. So we know the season. We don't know the day or the hour, but we do know the season. We're aware of those signs. But it will happen in God's time, not ours. 